Chapter 15, Regulation of Gene Expression. In this video, I want you to think through what it means to express something. And specifically, what does it mean to express a gene? So when you think of the word expression, what does that mean? And how does it connect to genes? I'll explain a little bit in this video, but just start thinking about that as you start. We will cover the following you must knows here, and then we'll actually start the impact of DNA methylation uh, at the end of the video, but we'll get into it more in the next one. Chapter 15, regulation of gene expression. What does this mean? Well, let's think back to what we've been learning about so far in this unit. We've been learning about gene expression, which is how do you take a piece of DNA, a gene, transcribe it into messenger RNA, and then translate it into some sort of product, whether that be polypeptide or a full protein or an enzyme. Uh, how do we express genes? How do we make genes? Now, when we're talking about regulation of gene expression, we're talking about the ability to control this expression. Can we speed it up? Can we slow it down? Can we pause it? Can we stop it altogether? How do we regulate gene expression? So some big questions we wanna look at is how do we turn on genes and off genes? And the reason this is important is because think of, think of you as a eukaryote, as a multicellular organism you are made up of around 40 trillion cells. And inside each cell, you have basically the same genome, except for your gametes. And that means you have the same genes, the same DNA, all 46 chromosomes in all of your cells. So you might notice that not all of your cells look alike, right? You have cells in your immune system and your nervous system and your muscular system. And so you have specialized or differentiated cells. And so because of that, cells need to turn on certain genes or off certain genes so that they can perform their unique functions. So for example, a cell in your nervous system will turn on different genes than a cell in your immune system because your cells need to make different products in order to have their different functions. So how does this work in eukaryotes? And we'll look at this video in how, how does this work in prokaryotes as well, like bacteria. So let's start with bacteria actually unicellular organisms, they don't have 40 trillion cells. They don't need to specialize or differentiate, but how do they turn on genes on or off? Well, the first thing you need to know is that bacteria need to respond quickly to changes in their environment. If there's one environmental stressor that could threaten the, the survival of that single, single cellular organism. So there's a couple ways that bacteria respond to their environment. The first is think about the fact that bacteria need to take in um, sources of energy to stay alive, right? They need to eat, they need food. Um, and so they also might need to create uh, inside of them products to help them stay alive, to metabolize like enzymes, to help them break down sugars that they consume from their environment. But if bacteria have enough of a product, if they have enough material to stay alive, to metabolize, they're gonna stop production of more. Why? Well, it costs energy to produce products. And so if you don't need to produce more products, let's stop, let's save energy. Um, and this would, would keep the bacteria alive longer if it's taking its sources of energy and using it in places that it needs. So how does it do this? Well, it actually stops the production of anabolic enzymes. Remember back to many units ago, we learned about anabolism, which is the building of molecules. And so bacteria have enzymes that they need to build that help them break down different products in their environment. So if you have enough of something, you don't need to build anything else. So you'll stop producing that product. So if there's a gene for a product in a bacteria, it'll turn that gene off so that it doesn't need to waste energy producing more of that product. But let's look at this other scenario. Let's say a bacteria finds a new food source or energy source and needs to use it very quickly. It's gonna take in that molecule. What is it gonna use it for? Metabolism, it's gonna take that molecule and break it down for energy. It's going to use that energy for growth and reproduction. How does it do this? How does it use that new food source? Well, it might need to start producing new enzymes. These enzymes are catabolic enzymes. Catabolism is the breaking down of molecules so that your body can metabolize, or your, in the case of bacteria, so the cell can metabolize. So the bacteria will turn on certain genes that build enzymes for catabolism, for breaking down molecules, so that you can actually use the materials that you're taking in, the food, so that you can get energy. So all of this has to do with just the survival of bacteria, turning on genes or turning off genes, basically to save energy 
and to survive in the environment. Now, let's think back to what we know about building molecules. Um, we know that molecules, let's say down here, we're trying to build an amino acid. That's a molecule that we want called tryptophan. Well, remember that chemical reactions build molecules or break down molecules. Anabolism would be the building of a molecule here. And you always start with some reactants that are going to be chemically manipulated to products. And often you use enzymes to catabolize or to um, speed up these, re these reactions. And so you'll have this precursor molecule and you'll use enzyme one, enzyme two. So there's a pathway, there's a series of, of reactions that need to happen to build a molecule. But if you have enough of that molecule, let's say you've built enough tryptophan, you don't need any more. And so this tryptophan will act as an all allosteric inhibitor. Remember back to our unit many, many units ago that allosteric inhibition means this molecule, tryptophan, will literally go and it will bind to enzyme one. And it will have a conformation change in enzyme one so that enzyme one stops working. And it's gonna stop this whole pathway so that we don't need to build any more tryptophan. We call this negative feedback because the, the building of something stops the whole process. Once we have enough of it, it stops. We regulate the activity of an enzyme. But there's another way to do this. Instead of allosteric inhibition of a molecule, we can actually regulate genes. We can turn off or on genes. So how do we do that? Well, we can block transcription of genes for all the enzymes in a synthesis pathway. So we'll save energy. We won't be building new enzymes because we don't need to do the, all these chemical reactions. We don't need any more of this product. So if we look at this example here, here's regulation of gene expression. So here's the DNA, that's the instructions for building each of these enzymes. And so if we have enough tryptophan, tryptophan will actually turn off of all of these genes all at once so that we don't need any more enzymes so that we don't make any more tryptophan. So this is still negative inhibition or negative feedback because we are enough of something is turning off something else. And in this case, instead of turning off the enzyme itself, we're turning off the production of enzymes. And this saves a lot of energy. We're not, it takes, it takes a lot of energy to build a protein. The ribosome requires energy. It takes energy to transcribe and translate. So let's just shut down the whole process because we don't need that process to happen anymore. So again, here's kind of a summary slide of what we just shared. We control the gene expression in bacteria so that they can adjust their environmental they're in a metabolism to environmental change. So they'll either um, build more enzymes or stop building enzymes. So we, they vary the amount of specific enzymes by regulating gene, gene transcription. So you have that piece of DNA to build an enzyme, but we're not even gonna transcribe it. Make no mRNA. And by this, we're turning genes on or turning genes off. And we've kind of talked about this already. So let's turn off the genes that code for enzymes if we don't need to build a product or break down a product. So this concept is related to this vocab word called an operon. And we're gonna take a look here at the idea that there are certain genes that are grouped together. So an operon, this is something you'll need to write down, is a group of genes that are grouped together with related functions. So for example, all of these genes could have the instructions to build enzymes in a certain metabolic pathway. So back to our tryptophan example, maybe there's a section of DNA that has all the instructions for building all five of these enzymes to make tryptophan. So basically all the genes are in the same area on a piece of DNA, they're grouped together. Now we have, we know that there is always the promoter at the beginning of a unit of transcription. Uh, so we know that RNA polymerase needs to bind to that promoter. Now for operons, remember operons, the main thing you need to know about that is that that's a group of genes all together, like one chunk of DNA. There's one promoter for the, all those genes. So if you look down here, here's gene one, gene two, gene three, gene four, gene five. And all of these genes are building, here's our mRNA, and then eventually translation, we're building one, two, three, four, five different enzymes. And these are those enzymes that build tryptophan, like we saw in the slide before. Um, but we only have here in the yellow, here's our promoter. We only have one promoter. And if that promoter is turned on and we have RNA polymerase bound, this is our enzyme that transcribes the DNA, then we will be able to make mRNA for all of these genes at once. So like we see here, it's transcribed as one unit and a single mRNA is made for all of these enzymes 
all at the same time. Now there's a piece called the operator that's right after the promoter. You see here, here's the operator in yellow. Oops, I said that before. So the promoter is in green. The operator is in yellow here. The promoter is where the RNA polymerase this year binds to start unwinding the DNA and start building mRNA. But the operator here is where a regulator protein can bind. Remember, binding means a latch on. So this is where the switch is, the switch on or the switch off. So if something is bound here, then that will stop or start RNA polymerase from building mRNA. So this is the switch. Okay, so this slide is super important for you to understand. Operons, genes group together. Promoter is where RNA polymerase binds. And an operator is the spot where we can turn on or turn off a gene, depending on if some molecule is bound to that spot. Now, there are two types of operons. The first type is called an inducible operon. To induce something means to start something or to activate. So an inducible operon means, let's say you have an operator here. You can actually add a molecule here to increase gene expression. So basically, we'll learn about this in a moment, but here's our RNA polymerase. If you have an inducible operon, if a molecule binds here, it's going to make RNA polymerase more um, chemically able to bind to the DNA. So more willing to bind to the DNA. Just it makes the chemical structure of the RNA polymerase bind easier and faster. You also have repressible operons where molecules, if they bind to the operator, it can turn genes off. So it can stop the RNA polymerase from ever making messenger RNA. So we'll start with uh, repressible operons. How can we turn genes off? And we just kind of talked about this, but well, we know that to build proteins from genes, we need to transcribe the DNA into messenger RNA. And we know that we use an enzyme called RNA polymerase to create messenger RNA, to bind to our DNA at the promoter and to build messenger RNA by bringing in new nucleotides. So we can use something called a repressor protein that binds to the DNA near the promoter region. So here at the operator, near the promoter, right after the promoter, and it stops RNA polymerase from building messenger RNA. So it will bind this repressor protein. We'll see in a second what that looks like. It will bind to this yellow piece here, the operator, and it will block transcription so that everything shuts down. No transcription, no translation. So here's a model. Here's like kind of what it looks like. And we're going to get into a specific example in a second. But here's what it would look like to have a repressor protein. So here we have, here's our promoter, right? Here's our operator. This is where a molecule can bind. Here's an operon. So here's a series of genes that are all connected in one chemical pathway. Um, so this is our DNA here. Now, right now, our RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter, our Tata box here, because there's nothing stopping it from moving. But let's say we were to add a repressor protein. What happened to our RNA polymerase? Well, it cannot transcribe the DNA, so it will be released. It will not even bind. Okay, so RNA polymerase cannot bind. It basically blocks RNA polymerase from doing its job. Okay, so we're going to look at an example uh, of this happening in bacteria. And just to recap, remember, we know that when we want to build a molecule, we often need enzymes to, to allow this, this process to happen. You start with some sort of precursor. The enzyme will change the shape, and then you'll after multiple steps, you'll build your product. And we've also talked today about how you have pieces of DNA or genes here that are the code for building these enzymes that let this whole thing happen. So if we were to turn off all of these genes, then we would not be able to build any more tryptophan amino acid here. If we were to turn on these genes, then you can build tryptophan. So again, think back to why we're doing this, because bacteria, if they need to build tryptophan, and they, they really need it, they need to survive and build this product, they will, they'll turn the genes on. But once you have enough, let's not waste any more energy building more, we have enough. So let's turn those genes off. Okay, so here's that example of a repressible operon. We can turn the gene off, um, but here's an example of it just being on, right? If we can turn it off, that means it can also be turned on. So let's walk through this picture here. So at this point right here, Okay, let's focus on this half of the molecule. Here's our operon. Okay, here's gene one, gene two, gene three, gene four, gene five. 
And we know that each of these genes can be transcribed into messenger RNA 5 prime to 3 prime. And that's done through our molecule here, RNA polymerase, which will read the DNA and make messenger RNA. Eventually, this mRNA will go and it will build each of these products using a ribosome. And these are polypeptide subunits, and they will eventually uh, be, act as enzymes to make our tryptophan, right? So that's the operon piece. But we can also see here that there's nothing bound to the operator. So that's why the RNA polymerase can make your mRNA. Now, another piece over here that we need to see, and there's a lot of space. So if we were to actually zoom all the way to the left, past other, past other genes here, on another section of our DNA, we have a different gene. And this gene is called a regulatory gene. So it's not involved in building these enzymes, but it's going to regulate this gene right here. Now, once we transcribe this into mRNA, we're going to build a protein that actually acts as a repressor for this um, operon. So if it can bind to the operator, then it will stop the RNA polymerase from going. But notice that when the repressor, repressor means to stop, is built, the molecule, it's actually in a shape that it can't bind to the operator. It's not able to yet. And the reason for that, we'll look at in a second, but this is normally what happens. Normally, we call this our trip operon because it can build tryptophan, or it builds at least enzymes to build tryptophan. And then there's another spot we need to be aware of, we need to watch out for. It's building this repressor, but at this point it can't bind. What would cause this repressor protein to bind? Well, think about it. Why would we need to stop making tryptophan? Well, remember, we need to stop making tryptophan when we have enough. So if there's a lot of tryptophan available, it's gonna do something to this repressor protein, and it's gonna maybe cause this repressor protein to bind here. So let's take a look at what that looks like here. So when you have a lot of tryptophan, you don't need to make any more. We don't need to do any of this down here. We wanna turn this operon off. What do we do? Well, remember back to our repressor protein that we built over here, we couldn't bind before, but let's say you have a lot of tryptophan. Well, the tryptophan acts as something called a co-repressor, and it's going to bind allosterically to the regulatory protein. Now, allosteric binding means it's not binding to the active site here. This is the part where it catalyzes a reaction, but it's gonna to bind to an allosteric site, a site away. Allo means away from the active site. But notice what happens when our co-repressor, our allosteric repressor binds to our protein. Notice that the shape of our protein, repressor protein has changed, conformation change once it's bound to tryptophan. Now we call this an active trip repressor because now it's at the shape where it can actually bind to the operator here. Oh no, what happens when the active trip repressor binds to the operator? Can our RNA polymerase transcribe our piece of DNA? No, we cannot. We cannot build any RNA because we have a repressor protein that's bound. So you're gonna stop making your tryptophan. So let's recap a repressible operon. First, what is an operon? An operon is a series of genes in one section of a DNA that all code for products that build or break down other molecules. We know that in front of an operon, we have a piece of DNA called an operator that controls, that regulates the gene expression. We know that before the operator is our promoter, where the RNA polymerase can bind if the promoter is bound by RNA polymerase, then RNA polymerase is able to read the DNA and build our messenger RNA, which will then go on to ribosomes and build our product. We know that elsewhere on the DNA, we have other genes called regulatory genes. And these genes code for proteins that can either bind to the operator and turn the operator on or turn the operator off. In this case, the uh, repressor proteins are inactive until you have a co-repressor that binds to the allosteric site. If that's bound, then now the repressor is able to bind to our DNA and stop our RNA polymerase from transcribing our DNA. 
So we call it a repressible operon because our operator is able to be repressed. It's able to be stopped if there's something that's bound to it. Okay, and then again, why would we need to do this? Because when we have enough tryptophan available, we don't need all these enzymes. We do not need to build these so that we can make more tryptophan. Tryptophan will turn the operator off so that none of these can be made. Let's look at another type, the second type of operons, and that's called an inducible operon. Before I go into the operon and what it looks like, I wanna kinda of explain the context or the background. So remember, we're thinking about bacteria and we're, we know that bacteria need to take in nutrients to survive. They need to eat sugar. And so oftentimes bacteria will be able to eat lactose. So if you actually think about this, E. coli can be found in your gut. So if you were to eat, drink milk, if you were to drink lactose then the bacteria, they're able to actually take in that lactose and use it for metabolism, use it to get energy, just like you can. But the problem with lactose is that it's actually a disaccharide. It's a sugar. It's made of two monosaccharides. And in order for the bacteria to use this, it needs to break down the lactose into two smaller monosaccharides, galactose and glucose. And that takes an enzyme called lactase and some other enzymes as well that break this down. Now, this takes some energy, right, to build this lactase and break this stuff down. It takes some energy. So here's the deal. If bacteria actually are exposed to glucose itself, just pure glucose and not lactose. Glucose is a monosaccharide. It's easier to break this down. And so the bacteria will use that glucose for metabolism, for cellular respiration, instead of using the, the lactose. So if there's enough glucose available, do we need lactase? No, because we don't even need to break down lactose. We're not going to use it. We're going to rely on just our glucose. But let's say the bacteria are starved of glucose. There's no glucose available. All we have is lactose. Well, then what might we need to build? We might need to build some enzymes that break down lactose so that the bacteria can actually use that to metabolize. So let's take a look at what this operon looks like. And it's now we're connected to the sugar lactose. So let's start here with the lactose normally. So normally, our bacteria are going to rely on glucose. So normally, here's our operator. Okay, so we have our binding site here, and then we have a series of genes in this direction, which will make eventually enzymes to break down lactose. But if we just have glucose, we don't want to make those enzymes. We don't want to waste energy making that enzyme. So we don't really want this operator turned on. So what we'll do is we'll look here at our regulatory gene, LAC1. This gene builds messenger RNA that will then build a protein that's a re repressor. But notice here that our repressor does not need any allosteric molecule to bind. Why is that? Well, it's because we don't need anything bound here. There's nothing bound. We don't. Let's say in this case, we don't even have lactose because we're relying on glucose for our food. We have glucose available. So there's nothing bound here. And so this repressor is on. It can actually bind to our operator. And if it's bound, then our RNA polymerase cannot go. So it's not going to make any RNA. It's not going to build enzymes to break down lactose because we don't even have lactose in the first place. We have glucose instead. Okay, so in this case, our operon is turned off. And why is this? Well, we just talked about this. Glucose is available. E. coli will break it down for energy. We don't have lactose present. But let's say we don't have glucose present, but we do have lactose. Well, remember, lactose, we need to break it down into its smaller pieces. So we need to build an enzyme for this reaction to occur. So we need to make lactose digesting enzymes. So let's look at this operon again. So here is LAC-Z, LAC-Y, LAC-A. These are the genes that are transcribed into mRNA that will eventually build enzymes. And these enzymes are enzymes that will break down lactose. Okay, so this is if we have lactose, we need to break it down. So let's take a look at our regulatory gene, LAC1. We transcribe to mRNA and we translate to protein. But normally this is on, it's turned on and it will bind here. But what if we don't want anything bound? What if we do want to build protein? What if we do want to build these enzymes here? 
Well, our lactose here, or we call it allolactose, but it's lactose this year, is called an inducer. What will it do? It will bind to our protein, our repressor protein, our lac repressor, and it will change conformational change in the protein. So can this protein bind to our operator? No, it doesn't fit anymore. So because it can't bind, can our RNA polymerase go along and transcribe? Yes, it can. So this gene is turned on. The gene is turned on because our repressor is turned off. Why is that? Because our lactose here, or another word is allolactose, acts as an allosteric inhibitor that inhibits the repressor protein. And so now we have nothing bound to our DNA. When I was learning this for the first time, it was quite confusing because there's so many different pieces. So I encourage you to write these notes down and start thinking about the idea of turning off genes or turning on genes. The basic idea is that repressor proteins bound to an operator can turn the genes off. When that repressor protein is taken away, the gene is turned on. But again, there's different ways to do this depending on what kind of molecules you have present in your solution or around your bacteria. So like, let's think back to our two operons we learned about. The first one is a repressible operon. So this is our tryptophan or a trip operon. These operons are sections of genes that function in anabolic pathways in building molecules like building tryptophan. We're trying to synthesize or build end products like tryptophan. But we know that when an end product is in excess, the cell will allocate resources to other things and will stop building the enzymes that we need to build molecules. The second type is an inducible operon. And our example is our LAC operon or a lactose operon, a section of genes that will build enzymes to break down lactose. Now these operons, inducible operons, function in catabolic pathways. And we're trying to digest nutrients into simpler molecules. And we produce, we only want to produce enzymes to break down or to catabolize molecules when the nutrient is available. So you're only going to want to build enzymes to break down lactose when you have lactose available. It's not going to build enzymes to break down lactose if it does not have lactose available. So now let's talk about eukaryotic transcription. What's the difference between eukaryotic transcription and regulation of transcription eukaryotes versus prokaryotes? And we know that for prokaryotes, bacteria we use the operon system where we can turn on or off these genes using repressor proteins at the operator. But what about eukaryotes? Well, let's take a look again at transcription. We know that for eukaryotes, here's our double-stranded DNA, and we have a promoter sequence here. And we know that we need to build something called an initiation complex, a group of molecules that initiate and start transcription. So if we look here, here's our promoter, and we need something called a transcription factor to bind to the promoter region upstream of a gene. What does upstream mean? It means right before the gene. So if here's five prime to three prime, it's more near the five prime end upstream. And this transcription factor, it's a molecule, it binds to the ta, -ta box. Now when the, this transcription factor binds, only then can RNA polymerase bind to the DNA. Basically what this transcription factor is doing is it's increasing the affinity of RNA polymerase to bind to DNA. What do I mean by that? RNA polymerase is floating around in the nucleus. If we have our transcription factor, basically it's gonna draw in our RNA polymerase to bind more quickly to our DNA so that we can start transcribing. But without a transcription factor, RNA polymerase would be less likely to bind. Okay, so how can we actually control how fast RNA polymerase will bind and how well RNA polymerase binds so that we can get started with our transcription? Well, just like we talked about, we have our promoter region. And if we look here, here's our promoter. And this is how we control the sequence of DNA nearby our gene. So we have the binding of two things, RNA polymerase, our enzyme that builds messenger RNA, and our transcription factor, which will allow the RNA polymerase to bind in the first place. Now we call this our base rate of transcription. When we're talking about the rate of transcription, we're talking about how much messenger RNA is transcribed in a certain amount of time. But what if we want to increase the rate of transcription? What if we want an enhanced rate, more quick trans translation or transcription? We're going to use something called an enhancer or an activator. 
what are these? They're distant control sequences. So they're not right next to the gene. They're somewhere else on the DNA. And an enhancer is a piece of DNA. It's a sequence. And this enhancer can be bound to an activator. So an activator is actually a protein. When this activator is bound to an enhancer sequence, we have a higher level of transcription. Why is that? Well, notice what's happening here. When our activator binds to an, our enhancer sequence, it's going to bring this piece of DNA closer to our gene. And it's actually going to allow our RNA polymerase to bind even faster to our DNA. It's going to increase, it's going to enhance the speed the RNA polymerase can bind. So think, thankfully, our activator speeds this up, speeds that process up, and it will bring the DNA, it will kind of bend the DNA in some ways so that the RNA polymerase can bind more quickly. So here is here it is again, here is our DNA. And normally we have our promoter sequence, our Tata box, and we need a transcription factor to bind here. And then our RNA polymerase can bind, and then we can transcribe DNA to RNA. But we have our enhancer DNA sequences at a distant section, a distant sequence away from our gene. And then we have activator proteins. These can bind to our enhancers and it stimulates transcription, it increases transcription. Why is that? Well, it's because it helps these other proteins come in, transcription factors come in and bind. It binds our distant enhancer to our DNA and it starts our transcription initiation complex. So we have our enhancer, our activators, our transcription factors, and they're all here together. And this is going to say, hey, RNA polymerase, get in here. We're ready to go. And RNA polymerase will hop on and start transcribing our DNA. Now there's other molecules that can are called silencer proteins. So let's say we have our enhancer sequence and these proteins bind here. They are going to block gene transcription. So they're going to stop the gene trans transcription from happening. They're going to stop RNA polymerase from being able to bind. So let's kind of take a look at this all together. I know it's kind of a little bit blurry here, but let me go through each one. So first let's look at enhancers. So here's our DNA molecule, and here is our gene that we want to build right here, over here. Now, in order to build our gene, we need our RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter. But in order for that to bind to the promoter, we need some transcription factors. But let's enhance the rate of transcription. So what we're gonna do here is our activator proteins will bind to parts of the DNA here called enhancers. When the activator proteins bind to the DNA, it will bend the DNA, bringing them near the promoter, even though they're like thousands of base pairs away. It's really far away. So then once you have the enhancers and the activators bound to our promoter, other transcription factors will come along and join the activator proteins, forming a protein complex, which binds to the gene promoter. So everyone's on board, ready to help RNA polymerase get on. Number three, the protein complex makes it easier for RNA polymerase to attach to the promoter and start transcribing this gene. So it increases the affinity of RNA polymerase to bind in a more quick way. Uh, then the next thing that could happen is our inhibitors, right? So we saw back here, or silencer proteins. So there's another sequence of DNA, and in this in this uh, picture, it actually calls it an insulator. But basically, understand the main concept. If you don't get all these terms down, I want you to basically be able to understand what's going on here. So an insulator can stop the enhancers from binding to the promoter. So we can stop these enhancers from binding to the promoter, but only in a certain scenario. That's if another protein, now it's, it's complicated here, right? This protein called CTCF, you don't need to memorize this, but just kind of understand the idea again. If this binds to our insulator, then this insulator can go block the enhancer from binding to the promoter. So with this bound, that can work. But what if we don't want this insulator to stop transcription? We can actually protect our insulator from this protein getting in. And we can do that by methylating our DNA. So methylation is the addition of a methyl group. So it's a functional group. So it's a, a, group of a group of atoms can bind here, these, these yellow pieces. 
to all the C nucleotides in this piece of DNA. And it prevents this CTCF, this binding factor, this protein, from attaching to the insulator. So it turns the insulator off, allowing the enhancers to bind to the promoter. So if this can't bind to the DNA, then this gene stays turned on. But if these methyl groups aren't there, this CTCF can bind here, and it will go over here and turn off the enhancer so that it cannot bind to the promoter. So as you can see, the main idea, we can either enhance and speed up transcription, or we can stop it and slow it down.